Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ann Mosley. I'm a vice president here at the Aspen Institute in the policy programs. Happen to work in a policy area focused on building economic security for low-income women and their families. Um, I work with a whole range of great colleagues here. And so on behalf of the entire Aspen Institute, welcome. Um, we have a sensational program here. Uh, and Aspen loves to sort of bring what are some of the sort of most interesting, most provocative, most important sort of authors, reporters, leaders uh, into this room <coughs> to have a discussion. And I want to thank Elma Gildenhorn, our longtime Aspen Institute trustee who makes this all possible. So on behalf of Walter and everybody else, thank you, Alma. Um, this is a sort of buzzing topic. I'm going to just be very uh, short and brief because the real show is right here on the stage. But um, just... Uh, before I do sort of formal introductions of um, both, uh, of course, Anne Marie, but just I want to thank Deborah Spar from coming over. She left the White House conference, or summit, I should say, on expanding um, higher ed opportunities. And so the President and First Lady was, were coming onto the stage, but she said she had to come be here with all of you. So I want to say thank you. <laughs> no pressure, good audience, buy books. Um, but uh, for many of us, I think this is an important time just to take a moment. It's been the 50-year anniversary on the war on poverty. And so when I think back 50 years and I think about where we are now, two things that really keep me sort of thinking, both energized and up at night, are really um, the growing issues around poverty and inequality in our country. And then I get excited when I think about the transformational role that women are playing in today's world. Um, these are sort of the heart of this. I had the chance yesterday to be um, with Anne Marie Slaughter. We both participated in the release of the Shriver Report. And the Shriver Report was a wonderful sort of brainchild, sort of sort of not even a report, it was really a movement that Maria did to really build on her father's legacy, Sergeant Shriver. And so um, with that said, I just really, there was a quote in there from Anne Marie that I, I wanted to sort of pull out that I think is a nice context for all of us for this discussion. Um, Anne Marie wrote very elo eloquently, our history is a process of trying to live up to our ideals, falling short, succeeding in some places, and trying again in others. Um, I could not agree more. Uh, if you go online, you can look at Shriver.org. Uh, I wrote on behalf of the Aspen Institute a chapter on personal solutions, collective impact. There's all that we can do in our individual lives as well as holding our systems accountable. So, so with no further ado, I really would just like to now formally introduce um, Anne Marie. And I brought the wrong page. Um, but so I don't even need to know. So Anne Marie is the president, she's the new president and CEO of the New America Foundation. And this is just um, as a colleague institution to the Aspen Institute. She is shaking up in wonderful ways over there. Um, she has uh, led a distinguished career in foreign policy um, at Princeton, at the Woodrow School. Um, she also wrote a very provocative um, piece for the Atlantic, um, Women Having It All, putting her own life out there. I think it sometimes can be, you know, you get challenged in one way when you're studying foreign policy, you're writing books like a new world order, but when you also put your personal life out there, that's not easy to do. Um, so with that said, I think there's no one sort of who's sort of creating more conversations, better able to lead this discussion. So I thank Anne Marie for making time in her busy okay. schedule. And one last shout out for Deborah Spar. Um, I want to thank you for your leadership at Barnard College. We have a great alum, Sarah Haight. Um, when we talk about um, Barnard alums not just sort of changing the world, but changing the way we see it. You're doing it every day. Your book does it. So here are two wonder women um, that we're delighted to introduce to you today. <laughs> Anne Marie. Thank you. Thank you. It, it, it's it's a wonderful to be here. I would be here because of the importance of the conversation for certain, uh, but I could not possibly turn down uh, an invitation to interview Deborah. Uh, Deborah and I met uh, at Harvard when she was in graduate school in government with my husband uh, in international relations, and I was then pursuing a PhD at the same time. We were all graduate students together. We will not go into some of the parties we went to. Uh, <laughs> and we then, when De Deborah was teaching at the Harvard Business School, I was teaching at Harvard Law School. Uh, we've known each other all our lives as uh, women who are interested in the world, particularly in, in global governance and the uh, global economy, uh, and have watched each other's careers and shared stories about uh, our children. Uh, so there's a, a, a strong friendship and a lot of admiration there. But what's particularly striking is exactly that you are looking at two women who are not about 
gender studies, feminism, the advancement of women. We have always been in our own lives. That's how we've always defined ourselves in part. But that has not been our professional life. And yet, here we both are for different reasons. We actually share an agent, too, <laughs> who is really wondering exactly how, how this all happened. But we're two women who wrote about our own personal lives out of a commitment to try to continue advance feminism, the cause of male-female equality, but also to shake up the current conversation. So I, I could not possibly have said no, and uh, you will, if you haven't read Wonder Women, you must read it, and Deborah will be signing afterwards. I'm going to start this conversation uh, by asking a couple of questions uh, about uh, what I see as the non-controversial part of Wonder Women, and then two parts that are maybe a little more controversial, if not in this crowd, maybe, maybe more broadly. Uh, the non-controversial part, I think, although I, I want to hear your, your reflections on this, is fundamentally, as the title suggests and as the wonderful cover image suggests, you're saying, take it easy on yourselves. You know, this vision of somebody just sent me uh, a commercial for Anjoli perfume from the 1980s that says basically, you know, I can, I can go make the bacon and fry it up in a pan, and when the kids are in bed, Never I can still make you a man. man. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's this, it, it's just impossible vision of this stunning blonde woman, you know, who goes off and puts in a full day and comes home and puts her kids to bed, and then guess what is still ready to whatever. Uh, and so, <laughs> so, so you're saying, whoa, 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 that is not realistic. So one way I think you might might hear what you're saying is you know yes lean in but but be easy on yourself is that a is that a that that would be the good bumper sticker version <laughs> um, but you know let me just take it back back uh, you know a notch because it's so interesting um, to get the response exactly like you just got in a room like this when you talk about these commercials <laughs> that so many of us remember right. you know they're goofy but they're important and they've seeped into our collective yeah. conscious. And when I, when I do a more formal presentation of this book, I always start with the image from the Charlie Perfume Yes, that's the one. And if you are a woman of a certain age and a man of a certain age, you remember that stupid commercial for that silly perfume. But it shaped yeah. women of our generation um, in very, very powerful ways because I think what so many women of our generation and younger girls today are growing up with is this deeply embedded sense that they can be perfect, that they can be Wonder Women. The Charlie ad, for those of you who don't remember it, is this gorgeous woman. It's, it's the model Shelley Hack. It oh, came yeah. out in 1973, in retrospect, sort of the height of feminism. But here was the Charlie girl, and she's clearly going off to work. But she's going off to work, A, looking like a model, and B, with a briefcase that's sort of, you know, behind her in one arm. And as I always say, you know, she's not worried about meeting with her boss. You know, she's going to have a good day at work. And in another one of the ads, she's got the briefcase in one hand and a baby in the other. And she's not worried about childcare. But child there's no spit-up anywhere well, on her. There's no spit-up. There's no issues with daycare. Um, you know, she hasn't just fired the nanny. And, and I think, you know, the, and it's easy to, again, it's easy to joke about this stuff. But I think what happens is that if these are the images that one is growing up with, they actually begin to form your reality. And I think I see so many, again, women our age and my students, who are, you know, sadly much younger, um, <laughs> kind of implicitly believing that not only are these the kinds of lives they are going to have, that they will be beautiful and successful and mothers and financially independent and sexy all the time, they also believe that if they don't achieve that, they've failed. So rather than setting out this crazy aspiration as a crazy aspiration, we've somehow come to believe that it's the norm. And so it's not just, I'm not saying, and I've gotten accused of this, so I'm a little prickly about oh. it, I'm not saying give up, Work. lean out, pull back, you know, forget it. I'm saying realize nobody, and you've made this point absolutely, nobody has it all. Nobody's Wonder Woman. Nobody's the Charlie girl. That was a fiction. And we need to realize that it's a fiction so we can start to build models of, of successful women, absolutely determined women, ambitious women, but not Wonder Women. So how do you respond to the criticism that, that I get all the time then, which is, yeah, but, you know, 
you want people to strive. Even though they're going to fall short, you don't want to discourage them. You don't want to say to younger women, don't try to be all these things. Let them go out, tell them they can do it. They'll try. Yes, they may fall short, but it's better than lowering the bar to start with. And I think, I mean, this is where you're, I haven't seen your book, obviously, but you know, I think you and Neither I are have I, but it's slightly, coming. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> slightly, slightly different versions or slightly different ways of approaching it. Because one of the, I, I, I'm really very careful not to say, give up or, you know, I tried it, but you shouldn't. What I'm trying to say is be realistic about the trade-offs that life entails. So you want to be Secretary of State, go for it. You probably shouldn't also be chairing the PTA. And yet, I, you know, yeah, yeah. we all know women like this who are running corporations and are also chairing the PTA. It's probably not fair to the PTA um, or their corporate job or whatever they're doing. I think men, for whatever reasons, perhaps just you know, a stronger history around this, men implicitly have a better sense of the trade-offs. And I always use the, the, the silly example, you know, that if a man has a major presentation to make tomorrow, he's probably not mowing the lawn tonight. Whereas every woman I know, even if she has a major presentation to make tomorrow, she's baking cupcakes for the bake sale because you don't want Charlie to show up with, with ring dings. And, and I think, you know, that's what I'm trying to get at. And, and I'm not saying that all women should make the choice to pursue their careers with, you know, full speed ahead. I think it's fully legitimate to make different kinds of choices, but we all have to make choices. And I think the beauty of what feminism has done is that it's given women, this, I, I use again a sort of a silly metaphor, it's given wi women this incredible candy store of options. You can have this, or this, or this, or this, but you can't have it all. And I may make different choices than you, but we're both going to have to make choices. So that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at the point that, yes, pursue your career with 150% if that's what you want, but don't also think you're going to have a perfect home and be a perfect m mother. There are no perfect mothers that I've ever encountered, other than my own, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's, 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 it's just realizing and making explicit those trade-offs. And that's why, and, and maybe this is rationalization for getting more personal in my book than, than I meant to be, um, or than I intended to, to be. But I, I do think there is a bit of a burden on, on women, quite frankly, like us, and I'm sure like many in this room, who do occasionally look like we're having it all. I think we need to fess up and say, you know, my car's a mess, mm -hmm. and I haven't taken my kid from my checkup in, in three and a half years. And, you know, and, and, just, and, just, and just be a little bit more honest about saying, yeah, I have been really lucky and blessed and I have a fabulous career and I'm lucky enough to have kids, but things are falling through the cracks all the time. Right, right. Because they have to be. Right, and that was the, the, the response I get frequently was people were, were very happy to see, I was admitting, like, look, they're, they're, I, I can't do this. You know, I thought I could do this. I can't do this. Um, I can over a lifetime, but I, I can't. Um, right now. <laughs> I, 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 I can't uh, uh, right now. Um, and I do, uh, I, I think that's right. There's a sense of, of wanting to be, you know, more honest about, about what those, those trade-offs are. The example I always give is that in first grade, I think, my older son was asked to draw his family, and he drew me as a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Not a person at a laptop. <laughs> Not mom holding the briefcase, a laptop. <laughs> And he drew his father cooking, uh, and you know, so so like anybody, I was not. Believe me, I was not cooking cupcakes. I was not. I wasn't ever trying. And I always say, you know, you don't even have to get into my house to see the mess. You can just look from. So, but but let's. I want to ask you one more question about the the having it all thing, and then then turn to the to biology. Um, you know, I, I guess the one place when you and I've talked about this, having it all is such a difficult thing and it is elitist and it sounds terrible and the one thing I've said since I wrote my articles uh, that I would I prefer never to use it again although for our generation it does resonate I mean people knew exactly what I meant uh, that that it was you know can you have a career and a family too in the same way men uh, men could and but it does it suggests having everything you want it's it, it, it's a fraught phrase and one that I would very happily abolish but there is this, this question, I want to put this to you directly. I still think, you, you say no one has it all, and I agree with you. 
Uh, and I've always said I prefer to strive than to want than to have in many ways. It's the striving that gives meaning and shape to our lives in many ways more than the having. But it, don't you still think it's true that men have more of it than women do? In other words, <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is that there are, and I agree with you, I think men do understand the trade-offs and men don't have enough time with their children. I totally agree with that. But isn't it still true that there are more men out there who have a really fulfilling career and a family too, a family that they are you know, committed to and engaged with, than, and, and when I say fulfilling career, they've hit whatever aspiration they had than women? I mean, isn't it still true that women yes. are having to make trade-offs that men don't have to make? No, I think, that, I think that's very true. And I, and I think, you know, if you will, this is the phase two. Where we say, okay, how do we actually now work for something that A, is more equal, and B isn't killing all of us because we don't want to make it more equal by making men more miserable. You know, that's 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 sometimes we do, but <laughs> most most mo those are rare. <laughs> uh, most most of the times we don't. Um, <laughs> but you know, I I think part of the argument that I'm trying to make is let's just sort of recognize what's going on here because I don't think we can start to get to phase two and solve the problems unless we really recognize what's going on. And and this is where I do sort of lean lean more towards the Sheryl Sandberg side of it. Um, I, think, I think women to some extent have been unrealistic or maybe not wholly truthful about what it is that's holding them back. Because part of what's holding us back is that the workplace is still discriminatory against women. But I actually don't think that's the biggest part anymore. I think it's more that, or certainly not, l not discriminating in the ways that they were in the 60s that's and 70s. True. That the discrimination such as it exists is much more subtle. Um, it's not based in regulations. It's not based to you know evil men sitting in the corner offices saying Roger no more that. girls around here. It is the fact. I mean, if we look at the data, women leave the workforce and certainly they leave the fast track after they have a child. Yes. And particularly after they have a second child. So I think we do, and this might segue to your to your next point. I think we do have to recognize more explicitly what the early feminists, for all good reasons, couldn't quite say, which is women have the babies. And I did my last book on reproductive medicine, so I'm very confident predicting this. <laughs> Women will continue to have the babies, and men will not, um, even if we have them through surrogates. Um, but as long as that fact remains, it does, it does change the playing field in fundamentally important ways. And I think we have to accept that and then move from there. And, and you and I, we've talked about this on a different panel, and, and, and I think it's a great question. You know, if we re can we really imagine a world where men um, started doing childcare from the moment their children were born. You know, would that change some of the social Absolutely. patterns that we, we, we live with right now? But at the moment, we haven't made those social changes. So insofar as the women get pregnant, carry the child, give birth, nurse that child, it does tend to make them the primary caregivers in ways that is, is quite important. So I think we need to acknowledge that at some level that is what sits it's not the only thing, but it's part of what sits at this inequality. Part of it, too, is, is the workplace. You know, the fact that, um, as I describe it, some l the detail in the book, women seem stuck at 16% of power positions across all sectors. That's not just because they're having babies. That appears to be, I would argue, some very invidious form of tokenism going on. That, okay, we've got two women here, done. You know, no mas needed. Um, but I think we need to look at the whole picture here instead of just focusing, again, as I think the early feminists had to, on what's going wrong in the workplace. That's a big part of it, but it's not the only part of it. Okay, so now we're gonna have a debate. <laughs> I, and so, so, so here's how I would reframe that uh, in terms of the biology matters to me, but what matters to me more is the way we respond to that biology. In other words, that the workplace is set up for someone who does not have children. The workplace is set up on the assumption that you can be there 24 hours a day, tw seven days a week. And that that's what Joan Williams calls the ideal worker, right? We, we have a workplace that was set up, here's the ideal worker and here's the ideal homemaker and they're two different people. And as long as there's a flow of family work supporting economic work, you can be there 24 seven, you can, and you can move and you can and do all those things. But that's because the workplace is set up to respond to male biology with the assumption of a full-time caretaker at home. And that if we just sort of draw, drew a big line under that and said, forget it. Now we're gonna set up a workplace on the assumption that human beings 
either reproduce and care for their children or care for their parents or care for the people they love, but that that's going to be a core part of who everybody is, you would have a workplace that looked closer to what you and I came up with. We were both professors, right? And it was hard. We got tenure and that was hard. Once you got tenure, we had the ability to say, I'm not coming in today. My kids, you know, got whatever, I'm going to work from home today. Or we, or to say, you know, I'm not going to take that trip. Or to say, no, I'm not going to move. So we had an ability to shape our lives that allowed both you and me to continue to rise to leadership positions because the workplace was shaped a certain way. So I guess I want to push back against the idea that it's biology and say, no, no, it's the way society responds to the biology. Yeah, and, and I think it's both. Okay. And I, think part, you know, I think part of it is, is um, I may be either more realistic or short term. And, and well, that may be the same thing. I mean, I think in an ideal world, absolutely. Let's draw the line. Let's start over. Let's recreate the workplace. I don't suspect that's going to happen anytime soon. So I think we should be fighting for it and hoping for it. But in the meantime, I find myself talking you know, to a lot of 18 to 22 year olds. And I feel that if I said to them, hold out for the perfect workplace, I'd actually be selling them a bill, a bill of goods. So I, I want particularly the young women I'm speaking to, sadly, to be able to say, look, the workplace you're going to, you know, if you're, if you're about to take a job at JP Morgan, you know, I wish I could tell you that you'll be able to reshape that workplace in a way that would be ideal, but I actually don't think you're going to be able to anytime soon. So how do we sort of muddle through with the workplace we have and hope that over time we get enough of us into positions of power so that we can start to shape it? But we're not there yet, and, and you know, if you, Scandinavia is closer, as they always are, um, and they've done some great things. Silicon Valley has done some interesting things. But we're not close. And I also think, um, and yeah, academia definitely makes it easier. Um, and I think that's, that's actually quite important to be able, and it's also controversial, to say to young women, as, as I do all the time, you know, if you really want a career and you know you want kids and you want a good relationship, it will be easier in some fields than others. Right. And, you know, and, and again, that's hard to say, but, but I think it's important because I don't want to say to a young woman, yeah, investment banking is great if you want four kids. Because it's not, you know, you need a stay-at-home spouse. Right. So, but but so then so right. that comes back to the biology right. point of view, right? Why, in fact, as we know from the New York Times, those people that have made it in investment banking, those women, they do have stay-at-home stay spouses. spouses. In fact, at the most powerful women's conference this year, I asked people to raise their hand. By definition, they were in leadership right. positions. Uh, if they had a stay-at-home spouse or a primary caregiver spouse, because those are not the same thing. Many of us, if you can afford help, but it's the person who's, who's there. And uh, a third to a half raised their hands. Right? I think this is the dirty... I bet you it's higher than that. I, I bet, bet you it's higher than that, too. But so, and of course that's right. No guys at the head of these corporations without somebody who is full-time taking care of family, providing, allowing, all of that. So why don't we attack the biology a different way? Why don't we say, actually, guys, it is not written. It was when you had to go out and fight the saber-toothed tiger, although, I mean, I think I could have figured out some ways to kill the saber-toothed tiger myself. But when it was just physical force, then yes, all right, the guy had to be out there, the woman had to be more like the home. But if you do believe that, in fact, biologically, men's brains change like women's brains change when they first hold that child. We have the neuroscience on it, right? If they are the caregiver from the beginning, their brains change too. No, they don't lactate. I understand that. But they are, if you think that they can be caregivers just as much as we can be breadwinners, why don't we attack the biology a different way? Why don't we say, you can do this, but you need to find a mate who's going to be willing and, and to I be full-time. And I think that's fine. And I, but it's the first part that I think we have to underscore, that if you want to have a really high-powered career in pretty much any field, and you want kids. And those are two big assumptions. Yeah, and you I don't think have to have women, either. I think, yeah, you don't have to have either. Um, somebody's going to have to stay home with the kids for some period of time. It can be the husband. It can be the grandmother. It can be world's best nanny. But somebody's got to do it. And I think absolutely you can, sh you can, you can muck with, with who the caregiver is. But what I think, I think you can't change that quickly or perhaps at all is the fact that if you want to be on the fast track, it's a full-time job. You know, you can't make partner at a law firm, at an investment bank. You can't get tenure at any major university yet by working 30 hours a week. 
And, and I had this conversation with Sylvia Ann Hewlett, um, s some of you may know, who wrote you know, On Ramps and Off Ramps and some while ago now. And I said to her, I said, didn't work, did it? She said, nope. You know, <laughs> Really good idea. Love the idea that you can take an off ramp off the fast track, have your kids go part time and come back on. It just hasn't proven to be true, with a couple of, of, of exceptions. And so again, my a lot, large part of what I'm trying to do is to just say, we just so we have realistic. to be realistic now, but we uh, I we guess can keep fighting, and yes, yeah, stay-at-home husbands or stay-at-home spouses. Um, I think that's a very powerful idea. And we were talking earlier. You know, every time I've been giving this these conversations a lot, every time I see more than one man in the room, I feel better, because because I think we oh. also there is still sort of a, a taboo against stay-at-home husbands. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's another part of the of the imagery that we have to change. And you, they may be tokens in another direction. There's a couple of commercials right now that have kind of the, you know, the macho dad doing the laundry. You know, if those become a little bit more prevalent, that will actually start to undermine uh, the Charlie mythology a bit. So and we were we talking that, you know, there are, there are freshman guys at Princeton now who say, I want to be a stay-at-home dad for some part of their careers, right? I mean, that's the other thing, You're the off ramp on-ramp, the, the other part of biology we need to take into account is longevity, right? The 22-year-olds, any your daughters, will have a, have a life expectancy of 86. That's, that's an average. That means a third of them will live to over 100. And if you talk to actuaries, they're starting to plan to 120. Now, you know, I know everybody's like, oh my god, but, but come on, you know, that is plenty of time for people to have fa for kids, grandkids, stay home, go back into the workforce. If you do it if, all over again. Well, but but if you also, <laughs> but but there's I mean yes it hasn't worked now but it hasn't worked now because the assumption is let's take your and my profession, in academia you and I both know you can get a PhD you can come out you can be a star you can be on tenure track you take some time out to have your kids you cannot get tenure at the same quality institution in your 40s. You're not considered. Explain to me why exactly you're not considered. You're going to be writing till you're 80, right? You're going to be writing books. You've got 40 years ahead of you. Why is it that we can't read your material and say, is this person as qualified as this person just because you're 40 or 45 or 50? There's no reason except that it was set up for a different world. And that, that seems to me, you know, to think, and that could be true for a man too. So the guy wants to support his career. Why can't he get hired when he's 40 or 45? I want to ask you one, I, I know this audience is raring to ask questions, I, um, I want to ask you about, um, about where you do see a role for men. So as you say, we have to be real, you, you know, you're advising people right now. How would you, I mean, you're, you're the head of a woman's college, but you've got, you know, you, you, how, would, how do you see the role of young men changing? How would you advise them if you were thinking about well, your book. and this is where I actually am And you have two sons, two right? Sons, so yeah. I <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. As I said, you know, when I, when I do student events, there's a fairly high number of men in the room. Now, I always ask them, but I don't tell me that, you know, that they have to give me an answer, how many of them were dragged by their girlfriends, and everybody gets a little red, yep, you know, in I've the cheeks. <laughs> but, but it's still good. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I've had a couple of, of young men, uh, one at University of Chicago, one at Middlebury, put their hands up and say, Okay, so I have a girlfriend, I think we're serious, um, we know we want to have kids, but I want to go to Dubai because I'm taking an internship, and I just love the question. Because, you know, my answer is always, okay, don't worry right now. But the fact that they are, that they are taking on that, that worry, that, that notion of, of juggling, I think it's really, really powerful. They're not going to figure it out right away. But just the fact that they're taking responsibility, I think, is very encouraging. That's totally anecdotal, but I, but I see it. I think the other um, uh, avenues of bring, where, where men can play a huge role in this is, first of all, understanding the inequities on the home front. So, so one of the uh, you know, sort of half jokes I get all the time, I make a, a big deal in my book about you know, how many men actually not, o not only make you know, their children's dental appointments, but even know where the dentist is, or that their children have teeth. I mean, you know, how, and, and so men are, men, I'm constantly getting emails from men saying, and now I make the dental appointments, which, you know, which is trivial, but kind of nice, you know, and I think just pointing out those things and, and having men sort of realize that, 
you know, it's not just doing the physical labor or doing things when their wives or partners ask them to. It's actually taking ownership of it. Um, I think men in the workplace, you know, in any, you know, I spent 20 years at Harvard Business School, so I've been in a lot of male-dominated workplaces. I think most men want to make the workplace more female-friendly. Um, most men, just statistically speaking, have daughters. <laughs> they want their daughters to succeed. They just don't know how to do it. And so I think part of what, you know, corporate men or men in organizations can do, as every man in this room has, is show up at the events. You know, if there's a diversity event, if there's a women's event, show up. If it's only women talking, nothing's going to happen. Um, men at the top have to play, or men at, you know, in any kind of managerial position, play a role in doing what all too often now falls on the one or two women in the room of saying, gee, here's the list of folks who are now recommending for partner, managing director, whatever the heck it is. God, there's no women on it. There's no people of color on it. Those questions always fall to the women and people of color, and usually the women of color who play that double duty role. We need the white guys yep. to start interrogating who's being promoted, who's being um, given the raises, who's being hired. And the more white guys that take that as part of their job and reward their teams accordingly, the better. We need more men, and this is where they start generally getting uncomfortable. You know, to think about maternity policies, to think about family leave policies. Why is it only women thinking about family leave policies? We need men, and not just the HR heads, who also tend statistically to be women. We need men to actually grapple with these problems, and we need women to be bold enough to say to their male boss or the male colleague, here's what I need you to help me think through. Um, so I think there's a huge amount um, that men can do um, not just by being supportive, but by actually starting to push through and implement policies. And I'll just give you my one favorite example uh, recently from your old home, Harvard Law School. I was talking to a, a third year student at Harvard Law School who was right in that, the part of the process, so, and these you know, super bright kids going out, they're all gonna have a million job offers. And they were all in the process of going out and interviewing for these you know, very elite jobs. And because everybody knows the rankings, you know, it happened that the two highest ranked students in this, this particular class were both male. And they both made a pledge, which they stuck by, of every time they were interviewing with a law firm, they said, yes. what's it like to be a parent here? Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a huge change. And by the men normalizing that question, because they were not, not going to get the job offer as a result right. of asking that right. question, right. they normalized it for everybody oh, else. that's a great Isn't that's that a, 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 that's, a, that's a great example. So so let me ask you um, so so just to follow on that I I think one of the things that I changed in my own practice when I was still a, a, a professor was I started asking all my male students what they were thinking about in terms of being a parent and working. You know, cuz I'd said that to my women students forever, right? They'd come in and I'd say now if you're thinking about having a family and have you thought about this and have you thought about planning your career this way? And now and then the last year I was teaching, I just every man that came in, every male student who came and asked me for advice, I said, you know, have you thought about when you want to be a father? You know, you've got about 10 years where you can travel all around the world and you can do whatever you want, but there's going to be this period that, you know, you're going to need to take time to be a caregiver. And have you thought about that? Just, again, normalizing that, that that's, that's just part of what you expect. You're, gonna, you're talking to parents. You're talking to get, you're not talking to women. But I, here's a more personal question. Um, how willing are you to let Miltos, out. My husband. Her, her <laughs> wonderful husband. Do it his way. Do what his way? <laughs> okay, that's my question. So I'll just say, so, you know, uh, let, me, let me put this in a slightly different context. Gro Harlem Brundtland, who was the first woman uh, prime minister of Norway, said that she was asked when she was 35 uh, whether she wanted to come into the government to be a, a minister, and then she became prime minister later. And they had four kids, and her husband was full-time employed. And he said to her, you should do it. But he said, I'm going to take the kids, but I'm doing it my way. And my husband certainly said to me, whom you know well, I'll do this. And I'll do the dental appointments, I'll do whatever, but I'm doing it my way. You are not micromanaging me. You are not telling me. You're not calling up and asking me if I've done it. You're not t giving me lists of to-dos. You're not. T you know. You're not telling me that. Of course, you really know how to do this better. But it, I can do it in a pinch. I'm doing it. 
And I don't like that a lot of the time, right? I mean, he doesn't do it the way I do it. But the trade-off is He's doing it. So, and, and so the perfectionism thing, are we really willing we, to let go? Well, and we have to. And that, that, you know, that is part of the argument of the book, that you've got to give up, not only on the Charlie image, but on, I, I call it, you know, house porn. You know, what you <laughs> see in, you know, all these, they call them shelter magazines. You know, that I'm not only going to have the perfect home, I'm going to have the perfectly carved pumpkin and the perfectly made cupcake. You, you have to give up on, on the pumpkin all-nighters. Um, and, and no and, problem. And, yeah. <laughs> no, I did those. I did those. Um, and, and I have to say, I, I, know, I, I maybe, like, I'm a slow learner. Like, I, I'm there now, but I wasn't there in the, you know, the real height of when I had three little kids. Uh, the person who's been um, most helpful in, in helping me, in fact, dragging me through to see this, has been my middle son, who's just a very straight shooting kid. And he was the one, and I tell this anecdote in the book, when he was eight, I came home from work, as you know, as I was, you know, took my work clothes off, put my home clothes on, make dinner, cleared up dinner, and I was racing out the door to a PTA meeting. And he said, why are you going? And I said, oh, this is very important. He said, why? I said, well, it's your school. He's like, so? I don't care. And it was one of those rare <laughs> light bulb moments that I thought I was doing this for him, but I wasn't. I was doing it for me. I was doing it so I could feel like I checked that box of you know, being a good member of my community. And, and Andrew, who's my middle son, has retained, and he's not usually very nice about it, but he's very clear about it. <laughs> in really, um, and, you know, at one point when I was racing home to make dinner, he said, you're not a very good cook. <laughs> you know? And, and you know, in my, my, my job now, I'm, I, it comes with a, a housekeeper. And he said, she's a much better cook. Why are you cooking? And you know, and, you know much as this hurts, but again, you know, I was doing it for me, because I felt like if I'm a good mother, I'm going to cook. And, and he's actually been very, very helpful in pushing me to realize um, that I, I don't need to do these things. And again, it's taken me way longer, but, but I'm there now. I'm there now. So <laughs> last question, is there something you would do differently if you were revising the book right now? You've been, on, you've been talking to audiences since September, yeah. right? Is there something you would change? Ooh, God, that's a hard question. Um, you know, no, to be honest. Not that it's, not that it's a perfect book. <laughs> no. um, but, but I think, you know, one of the things, I, I'll now not answer your question. Um, you know, one of the, the, I fell into You didn't as, answer as the as one I, about Miltos either, I know, but I'll let I you off the hook. Um, <laughs> uh, as I suspect you did as well, I didn't mean to write a personal story no. in this book. I, you know, I really didn't set out to do it, but, but I think it w became sort of a form of therapy um, to, tell, uh, to tell some personal stories through the book. And, and I, think it, I think it worked, you know, because I think it, it was, um, I think sharing the personal stories was, was a good thing to do. And I think it, it legitimized other people telling me and telling each other um, their personal stories. Yes. Yeah, no, so it's actually, it's actually been a fun journey um, of watching. You know, I always feel books are like children. You sort of, you know, you create them, you put them out in the world, and you, you know, you hope for the best. Um, but, but thus far, I've, I've been happy with my that's little great. book. Yeah. Well, that's the perfect note to turn to all of you on. Uh, so uh, there, are, there are microphones here. Raise your hand. Introduce yourselves. And I will. Yes, there. Hi. Hold on one sec for the microphone. I have a question. Just who you are. OK. Thank you so much. This has been great. How do you make a two-career, long-distance marriage work with the wife as the leaving spouse for a job opportunity? Because that may or may not be happening to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, God, I hate to start by being pessimistic. No, it's hard. Um, I, I think you know it's doable for short periods of time. I know a couple of people who've done it over very extended periods of time. Two of my, my colleagues now are doing, you know, sort of intercontinental commutes. Um, I think it's, it's, it's doable. Um, I think once kids are in the mix, it becomes That's close really. to impossible. Um, I did it, Anne-Marie probably answered this as well, if not better than I can. I did it for one year um, when my eldest son was a year old. And um, I had actually turned down a job at Harvard to take a job at the University of Toronto. And then my oh, I'd sweet, that. you remember that? Yeah. Then my sweet <laughs> husband told me that he didn't want to go to Toronto. Um, and I commuted for a year. And I have to say, it was the hardest thing I ever did. Yeah. 
It was yeah. really yeah. hard. Yeah. Uh, but right. again, I was doing it with a one-year-old. Right. But yeah. I wouldn't do that again. I would say you can do it for limited periods of time. In other words, that, that um, well, <laughs> two, two nights. Two nights. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I actually think it's easier to do with younger kids than teenagers, yeah. as I've written by them. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's really, really hard. But if you've got a great care system, you, you can manage it when they're young. And they, when they are teenagers, it is just, I mean, it, it, you cannot outsource that, right? You cannot outsource being there when a, a teenager is either needs your advice or is making a really bad choice or, you know, there, there are, so at that point, I don't think it can be done. But, but I tell people, routinely, you know, for a year, if, if, for instance, this is something you absolutely need to do for your career. This is the equivalent of somebody going into work for the National Security Council in my business. You know, if you get a chance to work for the NSC and you want to be a foreign policy person, you ought to take that. You better know you're not going to have a life. So then I say to people, you can do it for a year. You know, it's going to be incredibly difficult, but you can do it for a time limited period and you at least get that on, on your CV. But overall, I'm, it's, it's hard. But pre-kids, I mean, it, it certainly can be, be done as long as you really privilege time. Yes. And do please introduce yourself. Yes, of course. Hi, I'm Alicia Sokol. Um, I started my career in investment banking. I married a surgeon, now I'm a freelance writer. Wow. So <laughs> I've completely changed my career, and I'm the one making cupcakes with the night. I still quite haven't learned, but I'm, I'm getting there. Right? Yeah, can you <laughs> talk? Um, the microphones are, are li on. no, these are getting louder, and yours is not working. So. I'll try to speak loudly. So my question to you, you made a really fascinating point about um, women showing each other a little bit of that, you know, taking away the facade that we're really not perfect. And I wanted to know um, how you feel that social media, which is becoming ever more um, pervasive, how that impacts this movement, given that it's a, you know, highly edited stream, uh, marketing the, the happy moments in our lives. How do you think that plays? I, I think it's oh, horrible. The question is just how is social media um, affecting the situation, given the propensity, unfortunate propensity, of women to be quite harsh on, on, on each other? Or, and and um, again, I wish I could be more optimistic here. But I think the, the you know the, the versions of ourselves that we portray in Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and all the things that I'm too old to <laughs> want to know about at this point is really really devastating. Uh, I have a 17 year old daughter, and you know when I watch and she's a pretty tough kid, but I watch what it does to her because you know the presumption is everybody is having a better time than I am, and and I think you magnify that or you multiply that by what's also happening in the old-fashioned print media. Because even there, you know, the images that young girls are seeing and not so young girls are seeing in print media, you know, have always been fantastical, but now they're digitally enhanced. Oh, geez. So the models that you're looking at in magazines are truly not human. You know, they're gorgeous to begin with, and then they're being photoshopped like mad. So, you know, a 16-year-old girl intellectually understands that her friends' lives aren't that wonderful and the models don't really look that way, but she actually doesn't understand that. Um, I don't know how we combat that. You know, we can say it. Um, there have been some lovely um, young women who've gone out there really talking about the inequities, the, the falsehood of all this, but it, it, is, it is just literally part of our ether now. And, and again, I think, you know, insofar as we can do anything, it is to you know to try and combat it with a, with, with at least occasional stories of you know the real blood and gore of life, which is never shown on Facebook anywhere. Uh, there. Yeah. Uh, I think it's coming. Might not work. Hi, my name is Catherine. This is great. I'm in the world of finance, so I very much appreciate where your book is and the messages that you're speaking to. I definitely relate to many of them, especially as a new mom. Where my question comes in is I very often see my clients' spouses, who are typically women, um, who have been stay-at-home just since my client base is a little bit older, that there's tons of data out there in terms of women, especially in their early 40s and late 40s when their children are grown, perhaps out of high school or beginning to um, <laughs> enter into 50s. high school, <laughs> right, well, but beginning not, not in their 50s. 40s, that they're a little lost, that they've dedicated so much to their children 
And you touched upon that we see these increasing numbers when it comes to longevity, and women do very often want to get back in the workforce. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to go make six figures or more, um, but there's a sense of purpose and self that they want to have relate to some type of compensation. And their job skills are not necessarily transferable to corporate America or other types of things. And what I don't see a lot of is tons of whether it be books or other conversations for those women. You know, my sister's one of those women right now, and it's just how does she enter back in without having kind of this group behind her, whereas for myself, who has chosen a career and delayed children, there's tons of these conversations, which is wonderful and still challenging, but there's this group that's kind of lost. I think, I think you're... Pass it to the woman next to you, please. I think you're so right in that, and I, I have conversations with these women all the time just because it's part of the world I live in. Yeah, born and, 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 and I have to say, I feel, you know, at least demographically speaking, I, I, I think it is a great untold story. I was actually talking to one of them um, to see if she wanted to write a piece jointly with me. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't quite get up the nerve to do it, which I understand. But we were going to call it a diary of a corporate wife um, because she is like, like many women um, I know, and I'm sure we all know, um, super smart, mm -hmm. you know, Ivy League education, MBA, married guy from grad school. Um, his career took off, hers was doing really well, but at some point when he hit the 90 hour a week mark, mm -hmm. um, which you Someone do. Had something had to give. Something, something had to give. Had to give. And, and it was as, her. And it was her, or it was her career. Um, three kids, they're all out of the house now. And, and she sits there, and again, I've heard the same conversation so many times, and it's always the same, saying, I'm kind of lost. You know, she's on boards, but she knows she's on boards because of her husband's wealth. And um, New York City is a very philanthropic city, so a lot of these women get, wind up getting deeply involved in philanthropies. They do great work, but they feel at their core that something is, right. is missing. And, you know, again, the longevity, you know, if this happens, um, you know, many of them are in their mid-40s. Mm -hmm. They're looking they're young. at they're young. 40, yeah. 50 That's years. Right. That's so let me, I mean. let me just throw out one path that I've seen some women take. And it's a path that I, I you know, I feel somewhat obligated to support because I think it's a really important path. Some of them are going into politics. Yes, yes. Because it's the Nancy Pelosi model. Because you actually can run for political yeah, that office. Is true. You know, unlike being an investment banker, banker, you don't have to have 30 years of track record behind you. And you know, it may be an interesting way to start thinking about how to get more women into political office. You know, run for the school board, run for county rep, and, and go from there. That's only one model. But somebody needs to write that book. Somebody also needs to write the book on single women. Because the, the stories we're all telling, we're all the same. You know, the, careers, marriage, kids, um, there's a whole different set of issues around single women. Or as one single woman said to me, you know, when my friends at the investment bank who are moms, they can get time off to go to their kids' ballet recital. Yep. Yep. I want to go to the, the, to the bar and meet a guy, because if I don't go to the bar and meet a guy, I'm never going to get to go to the ballet recital. <laughs> but I can't ask for that. Yeah. Which again, you know, I can tell it in a way that sounds funny, but it's actually, it's I think far more poignant than, than it is funny. So I can make something very concrete on that last one. I came from a meeting this morning with New America people about um, changing leave from sick leave, family leave, uh, paternity or maternity or parental leave to paid time off. Yeah. Right? Everybody gets an equal amount of paid time off to do, off whatever, you to do yeah. whatever you want with. Yeah. And, there are, and there are, so there, there are definitely ways, at least there, you can start to shift some of, some of these underlying assumptions. You were shaking your head really vigorously on the, on the po politics point of view. Um, let me, uh, is there, can you just bring the microphone up? And I know somebody's got a question back there, but I want to hear, because I know lots of women who are also running for office, and it strikes me, post kids, and it strikes me as a great model, but. <laughs> Yes, I'm Jamie Steam. I'm a syndicated columnist for Creator Syndicate. I'm all for women in politics, believe me, and it's going to raise the fact there's 20 women senators now. Yes. One out of five. That's a historic high. And I believe that women who are 47, like Nancy Pelosi was when she ran for office, should run for Congress. Yeah. Not, not the school board. Men don't start their careers no, by right. running for the school point. board. Yeah. Run for Congress. Yeah. Run for Congress. Run for whatever works. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. <laughs> 
aspire higher than yeah, school. Yeah, it's, it's a great it's a okay. for Congress. That's, that's, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's still a so that someone had and then, then I'll, I'll come up front here. Hi, is this? Hi, my name is Lori Mittenthal. I'm a working um, mother of three little girls. I was working full time, and then after I had twins, went part time. So I've created a good balance. Um, I was wondering if you could address sort of the insidious role of of guilt um, in this conversation, because it seems very easy for women to feel guilty, whatever their a little bit or a lot of guilt, no matter what their choice. So if you're a working mom, it's easy to feel guilty. You're not spending enough time with your kids. If you're stay at home but educated, um, it's easy to feel a little guilty that you're not leaning in. Can you talk a bit about that and how to sort of cast off that albatross or that mantle of guilt? And it's also, I don't see nearly as many men feeling guilty about um, the choices or struggling with that as much. I think you're, you're so right. Um, you know, everybody feels guilty. And, and I think it, you know, it, it really is an invidious problem because just to repeat what you said, the, the women who, who are working full time feel guilty for not staying home with their kids. The women who are staying home with their kids feel guilty that somehow they've abandoned the cause or, or um, they're letting other people down. And, and you know, my approach to it, not that it will solve it, but at least to start to chip away at it, is first of all to make clear, again, nobody's doing it all. So we've all made choices. And somehow we have to get comfortable legitimizing each other's choices. <coughs> Because I, and I, I think we start by, by trying not to make other people fail badly about their choices. Because if you've spent any time on a, on a playground, you, you see the mommy wars being played out. Oh, really? You stay home? You know, or, you know, go on. how do you find time to do your children's homework? To which I always want to say, I don't. It's their homework. Um, but but we, 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 we fall into these, into these games. And then, we, and then we go home and we feel badly that we've been mean, and we feel badly that we're not doing what we should be. And, and I do think part of it, and, and I I'm, I'm always hesitate saying this, but I think at some level, we're, we're giving too strong a message to young girls. And you, you have three, so you'll you know, very much experience this. I think for all the best reasons, we're, we're constantly saying to little girls all the way up to you know, my college age kids, you can do everything. You can be whatever you want to be. And I think we need to actually tone that down a little bit. Because that then they feel guilty if they're not doing everything. And somehow we say, you can be whatever whatever you want to be. You know, you can pick whatever you want to you what whatever you want to pick, but don't tell them they can do everything. And don't perpetuate that behavior of sort of constantly patting, we do this more to girls than to boys, patting them on the head and say, you're wonderful, you're perfect, you get a gold star. You got the lead in the play because everybody got the lead in the play. I mean, we, we, you know, we, we, ha you know we, we have to go back a little bit more to, you know, to, to moving away from, from constantly pretending that everybody's perfect because, again, n none of us are. And just, again, voicing the fact that we all feel guilt and we have to kind of move, move away from it. Um, is powerful. Just one last thought, and I usually end my presentation saying this. The whole point of feminism was to liberate women. If all we've done is make ourselves feel miserable, we've lost the plot. Okay, I, I, I want to come here, but let me just say one thing there that, uh, that I think we disagree here a little bit. I, I, I agree with you on no guilt. My mother's view actually was guilt is a useless emotion, and I've rarely felt guilty. I mean, I have told my kids from the beginning, I am such a better mother because I work. I would be a terrible mother if I stayed home, and they know that. They have no <laughs> doubt about that. And I just say, look, if I'm unhappy, I'm not going to be good at what I'm doing. I'm doing the best I can. But I, I see this a slightly different way. Part of the problem, I think, is that at the end of our lives, men are told, you know, if you, if you made it, if you were CEO, you had a successful life. I want to say, if you're CEO and you did not have meaningful, loving relationships with your children, your parents, your spouse, you failed. Because honestly, in my view, as human beings, that, that was part of what drove my decision, is I did not want to look back at the end of my life, at the end of my life and say, I missed my children being at home. I missed the last four years. I don't care what job I had. That's not the right values. And I would like men not to feel guilty 
But I would like to raise our sons so that they no longer think that the measure of success in life is just how much money they made or how much power they wielded. I want to raise men and women to believe a successful life is a life that earns, but also that gives, right? That also that is connected to those you love, to your community, that that's, those are human values. And that seems to me not about women. It seems to me that, that, that we're, We've, we're so skewed that we, we look at these guys and we say, yeah, you've succeeded, but ultimately their lives, I think, are emptier. I, 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 that's my soapbox. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Marie, I'm on your, <clears throat> I'm Alma Gildenhorn, and I think I'm on your soapbox. <laughs> um, just as uh, there's more than one flavor of ice cream, Everybody, there are many, many, many types of people in the world, men and women. And uh, I'll never forget uh, the uh, speech that uh, Barbara Bush uh, made at a commencement uh, in the first year that her husband was president. And she said to um, the graduating students, exactly, she gave them the message that you just gave. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's not all the accolades that you've received. It's about the people who care about you and who you care about. When I was a young woman and uh, faced with uh, pursuing a career uh, or staying home and taking and raising my children, my mother said to me, and it's been very, very good advice, you cannot trade one set of anxieties for another. And that got rid of all of my guilt. I had another, uh, I had another uh, thing that I always believed. And that took me, that has brought me through life. And it's been a career in the community, though at one time I had my own business. Uh, Today is not the first day of the rest of my life. You, can, you cannot wake up one morning and say, oh my God, I'm an empty nester. What will I do? First of all, your children come back. They <laughs> morph into different people. But they do come back and they hang on to you for dear life, which is wonderful if they're hanging on to you for all the right motives. But there is plenty to do in this community. There's plenty to keep you busy. Uh, there are people in need. You don't have to just sit on a board. You can work for a cause. Not everything is a big ball at uh, the Four Seasons Hotel. Uh, there are so many uh, activities that require intelligence, and time and attention, so that if you can pursue a full-time job or even a half-time job, there's plenty to do. And uh, I believe very strongly in that. I also believe in women who have careers, but never, ever let it diminish those who are doing things and staying at home. And I believe there's nothing wrong working for your PTA if you're making a difference in the education system. And I also agree with you that we can't keep telling our children every minute how wonderful they are, <laughs> when indeed, they're not that wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> they're wonderful to you, but you, I, think, I, I think that the encouragement that you give them to find, to reach out, but in reaching out, don't reach down. Try to reach up. Great. And they'll reach as high as they can, and not everybody reaches as high. Uh, as far as the corporate world, that's a whole other issue. But there are a million issues out there. But the only person you have to live with until you leave this world is yourself. So you better not trade one set of anxieties for another. That's a great phrase. I like the phrase. It's a great I like phrase. the phrase. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. There in the back. Yes. Hi, I'm Amber Jangha. And um, I, oh, excuse me, I appreciate the discussion because I'm sort of in the midst of a personal transition myself where 
I was working and now I'm not um, taking care of my kids due to my husband's career. And it's been a challenge. But, oh, can you hear me better now? Okay. Um, but I wanted to know, how does your research and work, your book, apply to single mothers that don't have the support network? And also, how does it apply to two working households where no one can opt out? Yeah. You know, I mean, there are a lot of working class people that maybe some of these solutions that we've discussed today wouldn't apply. It's, it's a fabulous question. And, and I think it's the question that, right, that rightfully needs to be asked of, of all of us who are writing books in this, in this realm. Because um, just, just to state the most obvious part, you know, being a single parent, whether it's a mom or a dad, although most single parents we know are moms, is just incredibly hard. And, and I think we, you know, we constantly have to be aware of that and try and find ways through the community, through extended families, through whatever other kinds of networks to support single parents because it's, they're doing an incredibly, incredibly difficult uh, job. In, in terms of some of the sort of broader class and socioeconomic issues, um, I, I think you, you know, insofar as you know, my book is, is partly a personal story, I have to be as honest as I can be in saying, I'm writing from what I know, which is the upper middle class. I'm white, I'm straight, I'm very highly educated. And so I can't claim to speak at all you know, for all women because I am writing from a very specific sphere. Having said that, though, I think there are some issues that very much cut across all women. And those are the issues around perfection, guilt, and trying to have it all. And you know, and I've certain, I, I think those sadly hit everybody, and to some extent, I think fall even harder on women of color, women who are the first in their families to go to college, women who are the first in their families to have professional jobs, because they're adhering to an even higher standard. You know, they really are being expected to be Wonder Women, take care of an extended family, be the ones who make it, be the one who change the family dynamic. So I think they feel the pressures we feel. Um, even more so, and the responsibility to somehow lower that pressure on them um, and create, again, different models of success, different models of how you live your life um, are really, really important. I, if I can just add for a second, uh, I, th I, think that's, I think that's right. And, and the, I mean, part of the issue about valuing caregiving and valuing care and valuing love and valuing that as, a, as just as important as competition, right? We all, we all have a sort of competitive, self-interested side, and we also have a loving and caring side, is to say that part of what that lets you see is we're not providing support for care, right? We're not, we, we have no infrastructure of care. We have an infrastructure of competition. We, we have roads and bridges and trains, even if they're falling apart, we have them. Uh, but we don't support uh, lower income parents, uh, many, majority of whom are women, but for, for, for men too. And it goes back to this question of if you value care, then you no longer see the time that you're out caring for someone as this blank spot on your resume or something to be embarrassed about. You see it as an incredibly important part of the human experience. You value it, you support it. At the, at, at the, uh, for lower income parents and caregivers of all kinds, but you also then, and this goes back to the point, you make it easier for men to do it, right? If you want men to be doing it, you have to value it. You have to value it for the women who are doing it, but you also, to, to make it something that we value in terms of what we say, and then also I think where we, we put, our, put our money. Um, there, yeah. Hold on one sec couple uh, quotes, statements, and then a, a question. Uh, I applaud not only uh, Sergeant Shriver, but Eunice Shriver. Yeah. One of the things that I've always admired about her, and I give uh, a lot of envy for Maria, was uh, Eunice once said, you can have everything, you just can't have it at the same time. And I, uh, that has been particularly inspirational because I do see in my own life those phases that you've alluded to as you go through career, family, parenting, uh, taking care of your own parents. Yeah. The other one is, is while I applaud the notion of having the husband adopt the uh, dental appointment, the moment the husbands adopt Christmas, that's the real threshold. <laughs> 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 uh, 
uh, my, my final point, though, is uh, so much of this is really about uh, control. And uh, it's been very interesting with my own children, particularly my daughter, as she goes off to college and has gone on to her own life. She's seen a certain side of me. She sees me as the mother, as Santa Claus. She sees me as the professional coming home. She sees me as the cook. And she goes, Mom, you did it all. And I said, honey, you haven't looked at my knees. They hurt. I've fallen so many times. And I've, I've made a special effort to let her know I've, how much I've failed. Because I want her to understand that there are choices here. And sometimes you don't succeed at every one of them. Because she then wants to go on to that perfect image. And honey, it's not, it's not attainable. And I've, real, and I've even gone to so far as my sons have said that as well. And I said, it's just not true. It just really is not true. And you, um, you mentioned something that I just want to pick up for a second, and, and that's a word we haven't mentioned yet, and that's the word control. Yeah. Um, this ties into your earlier question about, you know, are you willing to, to, let, you know, go. to let go? And, you know, one of the very sad things that, that struck me while I was researching and writing this book was how important control is for women. For reasons, I must confess, I don't fully understand. But, but, but I think something that's happened and it does seem to be more specific to women, is that because we're trying to succeed on so many different levels, we, we, want to we want to control things on all of those different levels, and when inevitably we can't, because there are so many things beyond our control, we focus on the minutia, and we focus particularly on our bodies, because we can control our bodies to some extent. And one of the things that wound up being a very prevalent theme through the book, although I really hadn't intended it to be, is anorexia. I wondered about that. Because it's interesting how often anorexia, anorexia is largely a women's disease, although somewhat frighteningly, it's starting to rise, you know, the rise among young men. Um, so as we go through these social shifts, you know, there may be some real downside to men as well. But anorexia, as I've come to understand it, is at the end of the day, it's not, it's an, it's not an illness about body image because you wind up looking horrible. It's an illness about control. And you see the, the primary victims of anorexia are very successful young women. You know, they're girls who turn in on themselves in their teenage years and control their calorie intake when they can't control the rest of, the rest of their, their world. And, and one of the arguments I make in the book, although it is an idealistic argument, is what we need to do is move away from this internally focused control and go back to the community norms, the societal goals. That's what feminism was about. It was about a collective movement. And I argue our generation, without meaning to, actually privatized feminism. And we made it about <laughs> controlling our lives rather than using our energies to affect the world. No, and that's a very that's unfortunate shift. That's, that's a very. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my goodness, there on the corner. I just have to say on the, on the Christmas thing, I always used to say my husband believes in Santa Claus because miraculously Christmas happens. So he was a little stung. So he's taken over the stockings. So now my kids go, yep, mom present, dad present, mom present, dad present. <laughs> because he gives it a completely different set of things <laughs> than, than, than I would. There. Well, it used to be that uh, women who made it to the top, those very few, adopted male characteristics. They had the more competitive, the more aggressive they were, the more successful they were. I think that's changing, although I think, as you said, a lot of it is about tokenism. Hey, we have two women here. We've checked that box. I'm wondering to what extent it's being valued now, the feminine styles of leadership, of collaboration, of long-term thinking, of being inclusive, of power with rather than power over, all those styles of feminine leadership that are actually so needed in our companies today. To what extent is that happening and being valued? All right, so I'm now just going to pitch shamelessly for one moment here. Um, so one of the things we're doing at Barnard is we've, we've, um, <laughs> we've launched this um, this center called the Athena Center for Leadership Studies. Oh. It's run by a woman named Kitty Colbert who came out of the reproductive rights movement, argued the Planned Parenthood case before the Supreme Court, is a force of nature. And Kitty is, has created what I really think is the best leadership center focusing on, on female leaders. And they've just come out with what they call the Core 10, which is leadership principles that are based around women's leadership styles. Because she points out any leadership book you read you know, it's kind of about Jack Welch, or you know, or, or some, some, which which is fine. I mean, and and, and you know, to be fair, 
he was a great leader and, and during a time when virtually all leaders were male. So fair enough, those are the models we have. So now we're looking at developing and putting out there what are the leadership styles of, of a new era, if you will. And they, they do tend to, be, tend to be different. So that's, that's the pitch to look at the core 10 out of Athena. Um, I'll just say um, I've been very lucky in my life to have gone through what I, I generally refer to as a hormonal shift because I spent 10 years of my life at Harvard Business School. It's a very male environment. And then I moved to Barnard College which is a very female environment. And so I really think I can say with at least some degree of personal credibility, they're different. Not, be not better or worse, but you know, I would never mistake a Barnard board meeting for an, an HBS board meeting. Um, you know, people dress differently, they act differently, the, 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 the chatter is different, the jokes are different, the compliments are different. And if you, you, know, you, you have the opportunity to see both worlds, of course, in an organization run by and dominated by men, the women who get to the top are going to behave like men because they've, they've conformed to the culture. Um, the men at Barnard behave more femininely because they conform to a dominant culture. And one of the things I've really tried to do at Barnard is bring more men. I actually created a men's committee. I put men on the board because I wanted to get that diversity. But I don't think we will ever see male-dominated organizations valuing women's skills until we break through that, that 16%. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, there, and then you're going to have the last question. <laughs> so just a quick comment on that last um, thing. I think that they are adopting some of those women's leadership styles and just not calling them that, calling them different things like newer and you know, open-minded leadership or shared leadership. But, um, but my question goes back to the thing about who someone needs to write a book about the single women or the women who are married but choose not no to have children. children. Um, and I think the stigma of not being in a relationship or not having children is so great that that's partly why that book has not been written right. yet. Right. And so I would just challenge those of you who do have children to continue to talk about it until somebody breaks through that stigma. Yeah, yeah, and it is, and, and I mean, there's a, there's a little movement of sort of childless by choice or child free by choice, but it's very small and kind of fringe. And you know, I really do think we need to put it out there as, you know, this is a very powerful model that people may either fall into or choose um, and we need, we need to celebrate it. But it still means you have people in your life you love. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 the, the fact that you may not have a spouse or children does not mean you don't have people you love and care about, anything yeah. like that. Sir, the last okay, question. Well, <laughs> the <laughs> great <laughs> man. Yeah, <laughs> <boy. clears throat> anyway, we talked a little bit about uh, politics as, as, a, as a, uh, an entree point. And uh, I realize this may be slightly uh, off the theme here, but, but I'd like to ask it anyway. It's likely, we, or it's possible, and, and more than possible, we have a female president and an ex-president. What, Im what, <laughs> what impact is this going to have on the things that, you, that you've been so eloquently talking about? And is this going to be uh, for, for good or for ill, or, or, or you know, we don't know? Yeah, well, well uh, you know, j just to say a, a one obvious point, the U.S. is behind the curve on Way this. Way behind. You know, we tend to think of ourselves as, you know, the number one feminist nation. You know, there are a lot of countries that have female heads of state. We don't. And a lot of countries, including Rwanda, although through a quota system, that have many more women in the parliament, in Congress, than we do. So we are, we're behind. Um, I think it would be fabulous to get, to get a woman. Uh, presuming it's the right one, and I, you know, I think there's there's a leading candidate probably in this room, um, and I'll just I'll end with with one more anecdote. I was in uh, Brazil last year. B Barnard has a, a women's conference in a different part of the world every year. We were in Brazil last year, where of course they do have a women's leader, and the minister of women's affairs there, who's a fabulous woman, was describing. Um, something had, that had recently happened to a friend of hers that the, the friend had a little girl who was six or seven, was about to have her birthday, and the mom was taking her to the store, you know, do you want a princess birthday or a Barbie birthday? She's like, no, I want a president birthday. <laughs> That's what happens hey. when you get women in the White House. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
you can see why you should read this book. You, sh uh, <laughs> you really, you should. Uh, that, you know, uh, I want to end just by saying that when we were all in graduate school together, the part I didn't say is Deborah was five to seven years younger than anybody else. She was on the fastest track of a very fast track. And we indeed used to say she's a wonder woman. She was, <laughs> was and is remarkable. But I want to I wanna end by thanking you precisely for being the incredibly accomplished person you are, for being the leader you are, and having the courage to draw aside the curtain and to say, you know, Yes, I have accomplished a great deal. I, I hope I've got a bright life in front of me, but I'm willing to show that it wasn't so seamless, that there were trade-offs, that there are all sorts of choices that have to be made, uh, and to, to not take the easy path of the Tumblr or Facebook perfect image. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>